CCS and CCU in the Nordic countries. Uh, my name is Nikki, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I work at the National Center for CCS at the Swedish Energy Agency, uh, but the Nordic cooperation lies close to my heart as I previously worked at Nordic Energy Research with CCS questions. Today, you will be able to listen to and to discuss the development of the CCUS value chain from a Nordic perspective. And you know, the Nordic countries have different starting points and different challenges ahead, so which our speaker Adrian will talk more about later. Uh, but through knowledge sharing opportunities, uh, such as today's event, the Nordic countries can learn from each other and better understand where a deepened collaboration is best needed. So Henrik, Hanne, Helga, Egil and Svante, we are very much looking forward to hear more about the CCS development in your respective countries shortly. Uh, today's uh, knowledge sharing opportunity is possible thanks to the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and the Nordic Council of Ministers through the Nordic Climate Transition Project. And of course, as well as IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, which has arranged it all. So thank you to all of you. Uh, regarding the technicalities, uh, if you need technical assistance, uh, Sita Sapu will help you through the chat. You uh, open the chat here below and you can uh, use a direct message directly to Sita if you need so. If you have any questions to our speakers, please write them in the chat for everyone, uh, clearly stating who the question is for. And we will have a Q&A session uh, after the presentation. And if you would like to ask for any clarifications or supplementary information, you can raise your hand and you will be able to, to ask your questions uh, in front of everyone. So, and as perhaps you saw, this first part of the webinar will be recorded uh, and the presentations will be shared through the project site later on. And with this, I would like to hand over the word to Marie Kolbay, Senior Advisor at Department for Growth and Climate at the Nordic Council of Ministers. Marie, please. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks for arranging this. I will try to share my screen with you all because I have made a presentation. Uh, I think I see if you can see my screen in front of you now. Um, Good. So I will talk a little bit about what, what the Nordic Council Ministers work on and, and the reason why we, we meet today. Um, so this is, um, this is a joint vision of the Nordic uh, Ministers and the Nordic countries to have a vision for 2032 to basically uh, become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. And this, um, this vision contains of 12 objectives, 12 goals, if you say, uh, basically where the five first ones, as you see, is targeting the green transition in the Nordic countries. So the first goal is about carbon neutrality to, to increase cooperation amongst the, the Nordic countries on, on, on this effort. And so we have biodiversity, circular economy, sustainable consumption, and international cooperation. That's basically targeting um, cooperation around the green transition. And then we also have uh, other goals relating to competitiveness and, and social um, uh, sustainability. So I think you can also see if I try to, yeah. So the Nordic Council of Ministers agreed in, in 2020 on this action plan and this roadmap to, for the objective to become the most sustainable and the integrated region in the world. So currently we're working under an action plan that runs for 2021 to 2024. And that basically outlines all the activities that are ongoing and supported by the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nordic institutions. Um, and that those can be found at the website for, for you to look at. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, a very important guiding document uh, from 2019. That's the Nordic Prime Minister's Declaration on Carbon Neutrality that was actually signed by the Nordic uh, Prime Ministers in, in 2019, as I said. And there is CCUS and CCU, CCS mentioned as an area of Nordic cooperation that they really would like to increase. 
Uh, so you can see the little quote on the slide there, um, basically saying that um, in increasing the, the development and deployment of carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilization, carbon capture and mineralization, and so on. So this is basically the framework that we're working on. And as I mentioned before, this is the specific uh, targets on, regarding the Nordic green region. Uh, so for this project, it specifically falls on the uh, goal number one or objective number one. And uh, in, in Swedish, it's called Klimatomstelling in Norden, which translates into climate um, neutrality in the Nordic, uh, I would say something similar to that. So that basically is uh, the uh, introduction uh, setting of, of this workshop and a little bit about the, the overall kind of political context of, of where we're working from. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Marie, uh, for setting the stage for our speakers, our Nordic speakers. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Henrik Sulzbruck, head of the vision for CCS and Arctic at the Danish Energy Agency. Please, the floor is yours, Henrik. Thank you very much. And I'll just see if I can share the screen. Looks like it's working. Um, first of all, thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, hosting this event. Um, I will uh, give you a brief uh, status and overview of uh, how CCS is looking in Denmark. And as uh, Nikki said, I'm uh, head of division. I've had a new office in the, in the Danish energy agency that are solely working with the CCUS. And we are part of the uh, Ministry of uh, Climate, Utilities and Energy in Denmark. So uh, uh, first, a brief uh, overview, uh, a lot of words, but basically uh, uh, three years ago, uh, we had the, the Danish Climate Act in, the, in Denmark that said we had these uh, emission reduction targets, 70% by 2030. And uh, that is sort of the, the kickoff for CCS in Denmark, because basically before the summer of 2020, uh, CO2 storage in the Denmark was not uh, allowed. And uh, there was not a lot of uh, companies looking at the CO2 capture at all. But that changed in the summer of 2020 the Climate Agreement for Energy and Industry, where it's uh, stated on the basis of the Climate Act that the CCS and CCUS is an essential element of achieving these uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions in Denmark. That led to a, uh, a strategy uh, that was uh, put in place in uh, 2021 uh, and uh, sort of put the roadmap for how do we deal with this in, uh, in Denmark. It also uh, identified that there's no uh, sort of business case for, uh, for CCUS in Denmark. So uh, in uh, 2020 and uh, subsequently the year after, and uh, even uh, this summer, uh, the politicians agreed on uh, quite a, a comprehensive uh, subsidy scheme, uh, which at the end uh, totals up to uh, 35, uh, 40 billion uh, Danish kroners. Uh, which is equivalent of uh, 5 billion euros uh, over 20 years, uh, which has to lead to reductions of 3.2 million tons a year of CO2. Um, so a political ambition and also some, uh, some funding that goes along with that. Obviously, sitting in the DEA, uh, we are looking a lot about the, the regulations. And uh, uh, since... Uh, the June 2020 agreement. We looked at uh, the London Protocol. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, introducing a, uh, a less comprehensive uh, approval process for projects that are not included in the CCS directive from EU. Uh, we have uh, amended a change to the Marine Environmental Act in Denmark because it was basically illegal to store uh, CO2 uh, in Danish waters. And uh, then uh, this uh, August, we opened the first uh, tender for CO2 uh, storage in, uh, in Denmark. So a lot of things has uh, been going on since uh, the summer of uh, June 2020. And the political ambition in Denmark is basically to uh, build a entire CCS value chain 
for the simplicity, I took out the U here, but uh, it includes the U as well. And that doesn't mean that uh, all of this, uh, let's say, uh, CO2 that are captured in Denmark has to be transported and stored in Denmark. But there's a political ambition that we uh, in Denmark uh, are able to supply service across the entire value chain and, uh, and be a uh, European hub for CO2 storage. Uh, be that uh, onshore or offshore. Um, if we then look at the subsidy schemes, uh, I will just uh, let you know that uh, we have plenty of information around this, but it's basically three different uh, political agreements. Uh, one from the June 2020, which is uh, the one that's called CCUS Fund, phase one and two. And then there's a, an agreement from uh, December 2021, which is uh, for negative emissions uh, from technological processes and next fund, we call it. And then just before this summer, there was a quite a big uh, political agreement in Denmark around the green tax reform, which also allocated uh, around 18.5 billion Danish kroners for, uh, for CCS. Uh, there's a lot of similarities in these funding and the, the the scheme that goes with it, but there's also some differences. But in total, it's uh, it's more than three million tons of uh, of CO two uh, reductions that should be uh, in place if all the money uh, gets out and uh, and flow. So um, I thought that the I'll skip this one in the interest of time. Uh, that since we are a, a community here with the government officials. Uh, it's fair to share some of the challenges that we have on that level in Denmark. And on the CO2 capture part, it's uh, a lot of the point sources in Denmark are uh, waste to energy plants or, uh, or other uh, power thermal plants. And uh, we, uh, they are all uh, regulated within the uh, uh, utility laws, let it be for, uh, for power or, uh, or heat. And there's some quite strict rules on what they can do. And the uh, CO2 capture is uh, one of them that are not seen as a core business. So we basically had to change uh, legislation in order for them to, uh, to make CO2 capture and in order for them to pay for it. Uh, then we are looking at the, how do they handle if there is, is a fossil uh, CO2, the EU ETS quotas in relation to CCS something that we haven't fixed yet. And then obviously the last part, which is also crucial for the participant is an overview of the permits for CO2 capture. Uh, it's across uh, states and municipalities and different uh, government uh, agencies that uh, are dealing with a completely new technological uh, scheme and, uh, and hasn't been tried before. So uh, that is uh, something that uh, at least provide me with some headaches uh, sometimes. On the CO2 transport uh, part, uh, part of the, uh, the acts and the, and the regulations are in place, but there's also uh, an identification that we probably need some new CO2 transport legislations, uh, specifically around the responsibilities of pipelines. And if it's uh, either private or state owned, uh, how do we ensure access uh, to, uh, to the pipeline infrastructure? And in order for that to be uh, to be in place, the government uh, last year uh, asked uh, sort of six regional clusters in Denmark to uh, come up with uh, rec recommendations on the CCUS infrastructure. And we are waiting on their input uh, later this year or early uh, next year. And based on that, we will put forward some uh, some recommendations on how do we uh, deal with this uh, within Denmark. And then obviously there's also work uh, going on in terms of uh, more transnational uh, transport of CO2, let it be a London protocol or bilateral agreements with, uh, with cross-border transport. And uh, some agreements might be, uh, be published soon on, the, on the, that part, uh, but uh, this is also a place where I think we in the Nordic countries can uh, and are, I know that for sure, uh, 
uh, collaborating on uh, on issues like this. Um, some of these uh, bilateral agreements are dealt with in uh, my ministry, so I don't have a lot of details on them. If we then come to the last part of the value chain uh, around the CO2 storage, there's a small inset map of uh, Denmark on the right hand uh, side of the screen um, with some uh, green uh, areas on and some darker green areas. Those are potential storage sites identified by the geological survey in Denmark. And the yellow dots are the major emitters. First of all, you see we have a limited amount of emitters and we have uh, ample space for storage, but uh, a lot of those are not mature. But uh, there are concrete projects ongoing. Uh, most of them are in the North Sea. And then uh, the Geological Survey have started the onshore seismic uh, preliminary studies. Uh, we opened the first tender for CO2 uh, storage in the western part of the North Sea. Uh, that opened the 15th of August this year, and we are closing it on uh, Friday and hope to be able to issue uh, uh, licenses for CO2 storage uh, after New Year. And then uh, it will probably take a couple of years before the first uh, projects are in place and ready to uh, inject uh, CO2. Um, on the same uh, note, uh, we have uh, begun the process of the strategic environmental impact assessment uh, for onshore CO2 investigation and storage licenses. And we expect to be able to, if there's still political backup for that, uh, to start the first tender for onshore licenses uh, uh, in 12 to 15 months time. So that was the uh, 10 minute uh, introduction to the status of CCS in, uh, in Denmark. Thanks. Thank you so much, Henrik. Uh, unfortunately, we don't can't give you any applause, uh, but virtually, but uh, perhaps this way is possible. Uh, very interesting to hear how much has happened just since 2019 in Denmark and how much is going to happen as well in the future. Uh, so thank you for that presentation. We will get back to you uh, with some questions later. Uh, but before we go on to our next speaker, we will try to test Helga's sound again. <laughs> Helga, are you able to hear us and are we able to hear you now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Then we are all settled uh, for when it's your time to present later on. Uh, but first, uh, we will hear from Finland and Hanne Sikavirta. Uh, she's a senior specialist at the Ministry of the Environment of Finland. Hanne, welcome. Hello, and thank you. Uh, I try to share my screen. Yes. I guess you see this now. Yes, we can see it. Great, and good morning everybody and thanks for the invitation and uh, I'm very impressed by the previous speaker and, and I think that the, that the uh, our, our uh, presentation is a bit shorter. But uh, first of all, something about the framework at uh, our national level. So there's a climate change act that has entered into force uh, July this year and a uh, key objective is to ensure that, that uh, we will achieve the carbon neutrality by 2035 at the latest. And also there are new emission reduction targets by uh, 2030 and 2040. And, and then the previous reduction target by 2050 is updated and you will see, see the figures here. And, and it's compared to the 1990 levels. Uh, during this government term, uh, several plans and strategies have been prepared and they are at the moment in the parliament. So there's the medium term climate change policy plan focusing on the uh, effort sharing sector and then climate and energy strategy and also climate plan for the land use sector. And uh, quite recently, uh, the uh, government appointed a parliamentary group that uh, aims for strong implementation of Finland's climate targets with long-term perspective uh, to support the national implementation and preparation processes. And, and it's until, uh, end of June uh, next year. Uh, on the CCUS, uh, some uh, 
specific features in Finland. So uh, there's no possibility for ge geological storage of CO2 in Finland. Uh, we have around 70 uh, large facilities emitting CO2, both fossil and, and biogenic. And in 2020, there were some plus 40 million tons of CO2 and 60% and of them biogenic. And the, these plants are located both at coast and inland. And meaning that, that if we will uh, store CO2 outside Finland, it needs to be transported by ship. Uh, then some uh, something about ongoing activities. These are also from the uh, plans and strategies, which I, I listed previously in previous slide. So uh, the sustainable growth program for Finland has allocated uh, 150 million euros to hydrogen carbon capture and utilization projects. And, and the e-fuels will be included in the transport fuel distribution obligation from the beginning of 2023. Also, the CCS CCU techniques, techniques to reduce CO2 emissions caused by waste incineration will be piloted. And there's a lot of diverse ongoing commercialization and piloting activi activities in Finland by the technology providers and also projects with major actors in the Finnish energy and process industry. There's an ongoing uh, strategic research project for carbon use and removals, also listing these uh, many of these activities in the previous bullets and looking also many other, other things. And it's, uh, there's a link if you uh, want something, some information, I think there should be something uh, in, in English as well. And, and there's also studies related to the voluntary carbon markets that have been commissioned by ministries. And there's a uh, collected information in the, our ministry's website available also in, in Swedish, and, and there's a quite interesting uh, report coming up soon. And, and my understanding is that eventually it will be also av available in English. Now it's in, in Finnish, but it uh, looks, looks at some, some very interesting topics like double coating and, and so on. And, and there's a, a work to address the legislative framework at EU level, national level, and also the preparatory work related to bilateral agreements, CCS, which I'm myself most involved with. So I think this was very brief uh, introduction from, from our side, and I'm looking forward to hearing others and participating to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks you so much, uh, Hanne. I'll give you a little applaud as well. <laughs> Uh, very interesting to hear what is uh, going on in Finland as well. Uh, and uh, now we're going to move on to Iceland and uh, Helga Barthadottir. Uh, she's head of division as well as deputy director at the Ministry for the Environment and National, uh, Natural Resources. Helga, the floor is yours. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we see your screen as well. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Sorry for this technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, I will just go briefly through what is happening in Iceland in regarding CC, CCS. Um, and I have to correct the name of the ministry. We have had changes in Iceland. So now it's the Ministry of Environment, Energy and Climate. So we have had new portfolio within the ministry, which maybe makes this uh, the CCS projects more, more relevant to our ministry than it has been. So. Um, just to set the scene in a way, we have our climate target is to reach at least 55 net greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030. And this target is to be achieved by acting jointly with the EU and its member states. Um, the effort sharing target for Iceland within this 55% uh, target has not yet been defined. So we are still waiting for, for what will happen there. But the previous uh, target within the effort sharing 
with the total in, within the target of 40% within the EU was 29%. So we are not quite sure what will happen there. But the government has though stated that we are to reach at least 55% reduction within the effort sharing. So no matter what the EU says and the, the, the maximum target there, it will be 50% 50, 50 according to the proposal. So this is a more ambitious target than we expect to get from the EU. Iceland has also a, a target on climate neutrality to be reached no later than 2040. And this has been, uh, this has been written into our Climate Act, this target. And then we have also a goal on to be fossil fuel free in Iceland 2040. So that's also a very ambitious goal. So this is so just to set the scene on where we stand there. Iceland has implemented the uh, CCS directive and that entered into force in 2015. And we have made some amendments to the, the directive and the implementation 2021 when the storage on industrial scale was permitted. Before that, it was only research uh, projects that were, those were allowed. Um, and we are now working on the regulation, which will, is based on the CCS directive. And we currently have one application for a storage permit, which is now in process within the system with the environmental agency and other agencies. Um, uh, also to mention that um, due to special geological circumstances in Iceland, uh, so conventional CCS has been forbidden because we don't have the right, uh, right underground to ca capture and storage CCS in a way that is most conventional. So, and, uh, sorry. And Iceland uh, and this, the government has not set forth a formal strategy on CCS, but it has though be, to be mentioned that in our action plan, we have two actions that include CCS. Uh, the one is from capturing CCS from uh, capturing CO2 from the uh, geothermal power plants in Iceland. And the other one is to capture C uh, CO2 from the power intensive industry, which is mostly aluminum smelters and ferrosilicon plants. And um, in 2019, the government, uh, the carb fix or the, uh, the uh, power, uh, Reykjavik Power, the mother company of carb fix, and the five power intensive companies uh, signed a declaration of in intent on to look into the carb fix uh, method and see if it could be fit for purpose for, for the power intensive industry. And fortunately, I, there hasn't much happened there, but they are still working on it. So, so maybe there will be more news on, on that and hopefully shortly. Um, and on, on the carb fix project, which is, uh, in a way, unique project, and it has been in operation since 2012. And as I mentioned before, it has been so like a research project until now. Um, with this method, method the, the CO2 is captured and dissolved in water, and then it is pumped down to the basaltic layers where it turns into stone. Actually, it's like a magic. Um, and yeah, as I said, this is, has been operated as a, uh, as a science project. But the, the limit for, for the definition of science project is 100 kiloton CO2 equivalent, and uh, Scarpix is very fast approaching that limit, and hence they are, will fall under the direct, full scope of the directive when that limit will be reached, has been reached. Um, also, to mention that we have uh, there is one demo plant on the direct air capture which is uh, situated uh, very close by the power plant where the Carpix has been operating. And they are in cooperation with Carpix um, and Carpix pumps down the CO2 that is captured with this direct air capture method. So we have to see what happens there if they will 
expand the the orca plant or what will happen there but it's up it's very good to i mean uh, direct air capture is very power intensive so it's vital to have green en energy and they also need some heat with the process so it's very well situated close by the power plant where they can both have access to green electricity as well as um, uh, excess heat from the power plant. Um, there have been some uh, discussion on import or transport of CO2 to Iceland and Carbfix is planning uh, to build a terminal or kind of a storage hub in Iceland, which they call Kota Terminal. And the idea is to import CO2 with ships from Europe and that it can come from all kinds of industry. I mean, yeah, from whatever is available there. And um, it's important to tell you that they, they got a big grant from EU, from the Innovation Fund recently. So, so there's a lot of things happening there. And also worth mentioning that uh, Carbfix has recently got the verification of the metho methodology they, they use from DNV. So that's also, also very recent. Um, don't know what happened here. I think I'm just my my presentation is over and mm -hmm. and just to add to this that um, um, we are looking into all the regulations, legal framework. What like I, we are not as we are not as far in the process as Denmark has is and was uh, presented before us uh, from Denmark. But there are lots of things that has been looked into regarding import. Uh, how does it fit within the ETS? All other legal re legal framework we have. So that's ongoing work. And we are, yeah. So I don't think I have anything more to add to this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helga. Really interesting to hear uh, what challenges Iceland are facing, but of course also the very specifics of yeah the the direct air capture plants and the carp fix master. It's very specific for Iceland. So really interesting to hear about that. And I can also say that I know Helga will uh, have to leave at ten fifteen today. Uh, so if any of our uh, participants have questions for Helga, uh, you can already start thinking about them now and uh, either write them in the chat or we'll take them first when we reach the Q&A session. Thank you, Helga. Uh, now uh, we will move on to Norway uh, and Egil Meisingset, who is the Deputy Director General of the section for CCS at the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy in Norway. Uh, welcome, Egil. The floor is yours. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Uh, no uh, PowerPoints from me this, this time. Uh, hopefully reflecting that we are beyond PowerPoints in our Norwegian experience now. But uh, I'll come back to that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to this forum. Some of you maybe have uh, blisters in your ears uh, when it comes to uh, Norwegians and CCS. As you know, we very well, Norway has advocated CCS for decades. And we are extremely pleased to see that also the Nordic countries take a clear position on CCS now and are pushing forward projects. We have uh, 26 years of experience with CCS and safe storage of CO2 under the seabed at the Sleitner and Snøvit fields uh, outside Norway. So we now have to store CO2 safely and permanently. Furthermore, there is a great potential for CO2 storage in geological formations beneath the seabed in the North Sea. However, in many European countries, geological storage onshore 
onshore will be a better solution. Positive experience with offshore storage will hopefully result in a more positive climate for onshore storage. That would have been good news for the cost of CCS and for the climate. Uh, I've been very loyal to the organizers, so I have uh, focused my introduction on the four themes you have uh, uh, expressed. So when it comes to the national targets for CCS, Norwegian targets for CCS is closely linked to our targets for the longship project. As many of you know, longship consists of CO2 capture from two hard to abate emitters a cement factory and the waste incineration plant, both in the Oslofjord area. CO2 is transported by ship to a terminal on the Norwegian west coast outside Bergen. From the terminal, the CO2 is transported via pipeline to a safe storage in an underground geological reservoir 2,600 meters under the seabed. The storage site is developed with spare capacity to receive CO2 on a commercial basis, hopefully creating opportunities for European capture projects, or should I say Nordic capture projects. The Norwegian state covers two thirds of the costs of the first phase of longship. And the support is structured to give the Northern Lights owners strong incentives to expand their storage business. Our overall target for CCS is to contribute to developing technology for CCS and facilitate a cost-effective solution for full-scale CCS in Norway, which will stimulate technological development in an international perspective. Uh, in more detail and more human speak, language that we, through Longship, we will demonstrate that CCS is safe and feasible, facilitate learning and cost reductions in subsequent projects, development infrastructure with additional capacity that other project can utilize, hence the threshold for establishing new carbon capture projects will be lowered. And facilitate business development. We can now observe that these targets are within reach. The fact that the first capture project, Norsen, is uh, almost 40% finished, and the Northern Lights, the storage part of the project, is also between 30 and 40% finished, this demonstrates that this is more than a PowerPoint project. This demonstration is real. We experience that the partners in Longship are expanding their business. Based on the experience from implementing Longship, Gasnova, the state enterprise which advises the Ministry of CCS, has produced several reports based on the Longship experience. This includes reports on regulatory learning and learnings from the development of the project. I, they, these are available on gasnova.no. I recommend that website. We observe that there is a great interest in utilizing the longship infrastructure. A number of companies have entered into intentional agreements for CO2 storage with Northern Lights, including a couple of Nordic companies, as you know. Last month, the first commercial agreement was signed with the fertilizer company Yara for CO2 from their facilities in Sluskil in the Netherlands. Northern Lights is now planning the next phase of the project an investment decision to expand the annual storage capacity with 5 million tons is expected next year. Two new storage licenses have been awarded, and in addition, one is in the pipeline. Also, 
Equinor and Vittersal last month announced a cooperation on CCS, including planning of a 900 kilometers long pipeline for CO2 transport. There is increased commercial interest for CO2 storage. More storage is needed to cap so capture sites can make investment decisions. The North Sea is well suited for CO2 storage. Norway wants to provide attractive storage areas to companies that provide solutions on a commercial basis to industrial customers. So when it comes to instruments for the promotion of CCS development that are planned deployment, with when the white paper on longship was presented to the Storting two years ago, it included a clear statement on financing of new CCS project in Norway. It said future Norwegian carbon capture facilities will need to compete for grants and state aid from general funding schemes, including the Norwegian climate funding instrument ANOVA and the EU's innovation fund. The state will not engage in direct negotiations on state aid with individual stakeholders. And the government expects that Europe will now follow suit and that the remaining capacity in the storage facility will be utilized by third parties that are not directly financed by the Norwegian state. That is exactly what is happening these days. So to conclude, we have not planned any new instrument targeting CCS for now. When it comes to obstacles in relation to possible support mechanisms, uh, we must of course always look for general support mechanisms where possible, where possible, unless there are serious market failures which actually is why we have supported CCS the way we have with Logship. But this market is developing in a sound way, I think. Having said that, and if I can choose one obstacle, I will choose the lack of coherent support mechanisms for negative emissions. I know that many of you present present here know more than me about the ongoing work on this. And I hope to learn more about this. When it comes to issues related to the balancing between CCS and CCU, this is very simple for me. To be a climate mitigation tool, there has to be an S in the end, meaning permanent storage. CCU is all fine, but should of course not be recognized as a climate mitigation tool unless it is an S in the end. And if CCUS shall be recognized as a climate mitigation tool, you have to do your life cycle analysis properly. And when it comes to balance, it is also worth to notice that the big volumes are in CCS. In a climate perspective, CCUS is only a supplement that can be, but can nevertheless be a valuable supplement. Next month, EU's new CCS forum will be arranged. We welcome the increased recognition in EU of CCS as a climate mitigation tool. We are very pleased to see that the EU is taking a more active role on CCS and underlining its importance in clean energy transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Egil. Of course, I think I can speak for everyone that uh, we're all monitoring very closely what is happening in Norway and uh, uh, what you are doing with great interest. Uh, but of course, it's interesting to hear what uh, challenges you see, of course, with negative emissions as well, uh, since that is something uh, I know that my 
colleague Svante, who will now take the floor, is uh, specifically um, interested in as well. Uh, but before he takes the floor, I think we will have to take the question for you, Helga, uh, that has come in the chat. Uh, and the question is, are the storage plans in Iceland mainly for onshore storage? And do you anticipate any problems with public acceptance there? Yes, um, the plans, ongoing plans are for onshore storage, but there are they are planning a new research project where they will try, as as I explained, the CO2 is result uh, of water. Mm -hmm. So now they will try to use salt water. And if that will be possible, they might get on, uh, offshore. And then there's lots of areas that can be used for storage if that will be possible. But that's just in the pipelines still, but but that is something that they will be looking looking into. Regarding public acceptance, the CARPIX project, as as it is now, the capturing from the the geothermal power plant and injection and storage, that has a huge um, it is is a favorable, very very positively looked at from from the general public, and they have they have been measuring the op, 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 the the position on this for for a long time and it's always very positive but um, the ideas of importing co2 that that might be a, a different thing and that's something that is just starting and they're just starting to present that project within the the local communities and so so that's just started so we don't know where that will go but um, but as as the project is now it gains uh, public acceptance, very high public acceptance. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Helga. And now it is uh, time for the last Nordic country to share what is going on in the CCUS. Uh, and it's my colleague, Svante Söderholm, Senior Advisor at the National Center for CCS at the Swedish Energy Agency. Svante, please. Thank you, Nikki. Good morning, everyone. I will say a few words about CCS in Sweden. Um, why Sweden is acting the way it does. Okay, so uh, now I see also trying to speak and to try to, to share the screen at the same time, which seems a little bit too much for me. So, uh, also, that's so fine, so far, so good. We can see and your screen now. now you so should that. see everything, I hope. Yes. So the, the, th the topic today is why Sweden is acting the way it does and what is lying ahead of us. That will be the focus. And the foundation for CCS in Sweden is the Swedish Climate Policy Framework. In June 2017, Sweden's Riksdag decided to introduce a climate policy framework with a climate act. The framework aims to create order and stability in climate policy and provide business and society with long-term and conditions that are stable and well-known. And it's also a key component of Sweden's efforts to comply with the Paris Agreement. With respect to today's topic, the important goals are that emission in Sweden must fall by at least 85% by 2045, compared with the situation in 1990. And, uh, and we should have zero net emission of greenhouse gases by 2045 and thereafter negative emissions. And this means that the drop by 85% that it remains 11 million tons of carbon di dioxide emissions that will be in some way compensated or neutralized for. And so the second point is that even if Sweden is doing a lot to implement CCS, Sweden has no formal CCS strategy in the sense that there is no strategy adopted by the parliament or one put forward by the government. However, in a public inquiry that was finalized 2020 on supplementary measures with focus on bio CCS, a brief plan for the implementation of CCS in Sweden was given. The inquiry was initiated as a result of the climate goals I mentioned earlier, those 11 million tons 2045, and the inquiry treated, treated mainly three ways to 
create supplementary measures, increased carbon sink in forest and land, land use, land use change and forestry, verified emissions in other countries, Article 6 in the Paris Agreement, and BioCCS or BEX if you prefer that term. Even if the inquiry was on supplementary measures, it treated CCS in a broad perspective. The report clearly shows that BioCCS is one important tool to reach climate goals in Sweden and that the development of BioCCS and CCS on fossil emissions are connected and that the, the development and implementation of one will help the other and vice versa. And as I said it in this public inquiry, it was a report. And in this report, there are three main points that so far has resulted in government assignments to the Swedish Energy Agency. And all of these three points were finalized last year. The first and the most important one is that there's a need for a support system. Since there is no business case today for negative emissions, and we proposed a support scheme in the form of reverse auctions. Secondly, a bilateral treaty within the first place Norway is needed to allow export of Swedish carbon dioxide for permanent storage in another country, Norway, according to the amendment of the London Protocol. A proposal for a treaty with Norway was produced and in the beginning of these years, the Prime Minister of Sweden and the Prime Minister of Norway uh, on a press conference stated that they are working with this and it's important to finalize this work. Other means, and, uh, and the other means of support than financial is also needed to implement CCS in Sweden. A national CCS center was started as a part of the Swedish Energy Agency. And also, also important to keep in mind that uh, the inquiry also pointed out the need for research and development and support to investments. And the instrument for this was already in place. We have a long-term project called the Industrial Leap, which runs from 2018 to 2040. And the budget this year is around 900 million Swedish crowns or 90 bi billions euro. And this is also as a, the climate policy framework, a long-term commitment from the state, which creates stable and known conditions. So if we look a little more into detail from the support scheme that we have proposed, we are working now with the implementation of this support scheme in the form of reverse auctions. And of course, the main reasons for choosing reverse auctions are that the state has a better control of cost. It is believed to be cost efficient and it decreases the risk of overcompensations. And finally, it complies with state aid rules, which is very important. And it should also be noted that stakeholders that we have been consulting, they are also in favor of reverse auctions. And if you look, as I said, more into detail of the proposed scheme, we see that we, the tentative goal 2030 is in line with the public inquiry as I have mentioned earlier which means that we should have a permanent storage of biogenic carbon dioxide of, of around 2 million tons per year, 2030. And to reach that point, we suggest a part of three auctions between 2023 and 2030. The reasons for having several auctions may, is that it makes it possible to ramp up, get more bids, learn about this instrument and to benefit from the most likely decreases in cost when the first generation of facilities has been built. And it should be noted that during the whole period, lessons can be learned and achieved knowledge from earlier auctions will be utilized. This means that the part that we have sketched is indicative. And for the first auction, we have in the report suggested an amount of 600 tons carbon dioxide per year and a support period of 11 years. And what lessons learned is that during our work with the design of the support scheme, it has been very clear that the important factors for achieving negative emissions in Sweden are long-term commitment from the state and that there should be a dialogue with stakeholders 
and they should be consulted in the design of the support scheme. So, so when it comes to, to, to what we are working with today, two important issues have, are, are, which are connected or what we are trying to treat right now. One is the reporting and accounting of negative emissions. There are several governmental assignments on reporting and accounting that are connected and partially overlapping. The responsible authorities, the Swedish Energy Agency and the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency are working with them in one project. It looks like that the authorities will propose that negative emissions should be reported as land use, land use change forestry, and that there should be a new category of hardwood products due to the permanence of CCS, which means that when carbon dioxide is stored in a geological formation, it's stored there for infinite time. And the other big issue is that utilities and industries would like to have two revenue streams related to a voluntary market for negative emission. And this fact raises several questions that must be treated and which are not fully compatible. Since the purpose of the state aid is to create negative emission as a supplementary measure in order to reach Sweden's climate goals and thereby fulfill Sweden's commitments according to Paris Agreement. And we have state aid rules, which means that bids and support must be, bid support that bid, bidders get from private sources must be adjusted for this private financing and we will, will need uh, monitoring and control to, to ensure that those that have won the auction are not overcompensated and that their bids are corrected for any private financing. And of course, a market is in the long run necessary since it, it's Sweden in the end wants a system that does not need state aid. And of course, although it has not been stated in the governmental assignment, it is clear that it is desired that the support system shall facilitate the emergence of a market. And today there are two different reporting and accounting system, systems that are independent, one for countries and one for enterprises. In spite of this, it is desirable that there is no double claims, private financing should cause additionality, our order actions should not be pushed away by compensating through buying negative emissions, etc. And today we are working hard to reconcile this issue in the best way for all involved parts. And these issues are important and must be clarified when the auction is announced and open next year. And of course, the development in Sweden depends on what is happening on a European level. Remember that the Commission will release a communication on certification of carbon dioxide removals in the end of this year. And my last slide, oops, no last slide here. Okay. So I don't know why I don't see you have a should be there should be a last slide, which more or less gives us what is happening in Sweden right now with future and ongoing projects. And on that slide, if you were able to see it, which unfortunately not are right now, it would say that our main project in Sweden is the Stockholm XE bioenergy plant, where, where they are going to install a full scale bio CCS plant with a capacity of 800 tons per annum. And we have several feasibility studies ongoing on mainly bio CCS and waste to energy. And of course, what is important since Sweden today has no own storage capacity, intermediate storage in a harbor, both on the west coast and on the east coast. That was all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svante. A little applaud for you as well. Uh, so, um, well, it is uh, clear that there is a lot going on in all of the Nordic countries uh, to ramp up the deployment of CCS. Uh, of course, all of you who have 
spoken today and your colleagues at the ministries and authorities as well as uh, industry and academia are all working very hard to make this happen in your respective countries. Uh, but today we're also here to uh, discuss the Nordic perspective on this and why there is a need for value chain coordination at a Nordic level. So therefore, I would like to introduce uh, Adrian Levert from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, who will present the, what research has to say about the need for uh, Nordic coordination uh, to scale up the CCS technology in the Nordics to the millions of tons needed to reach the Declaration of Nordic Carbon Neutrality, as Marie introduced us to in the beginning. So Adrian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, thank you so much for the opportunity to do this uh, short presentation. So, um, as we, I guess, all are familiar with, uh, CCS uh, has this problem that it's a very large uh, value chain. And uh, sometimes even different actors are uh, in charge of the different parts of the value chain. Uh, and of course, um, you could also have, uh, as we have discussed already, um, transportation of CO2 across country borders. So uh, naturally those uh, actors that are developing the storage capacity wants to see that they have CO2 that they want to store uh, before they make that investment. And on the other hand, those actors that are capturing the CO2 wants to make sure that there is somewhere to put the CO2 before they make that decision. So it becomes a coordination problem. And just like the chicken and the egg, it becomes a question of what comes first. And so my goal with this presentation is hopefully to uh, spark some thoughts on this um, a little more freshly uh, before you go into the uh, discussion groups. Uh, so just to uh, set the scene, I know everyone has just has mentioned this, but I wanted to have a, a recap slide here. So uh, here we have the emission targets, and I've, I've uh, bluntly named them all carbon neutral here. Uh, I'm sorry if someone feels like that was not appropriate. Uh, but it's notice noticeable that all the Nordic countries have this goal to become uh, carbon neutral or uh, something similar uh, before 2050 or by 2050. So it's quite soon. Um, so what do we have to work with then? Well, just to uh, bring everyone to the same, um, uh, how to say, same same map. Uh, I've made this map in Arcis uh, using the European Pollutant Release and Transfer Register data. Uh, I've used the year 2017 since that was the latest year where uh, all the countries have a complete data set in this database. And so you can see here that uh, the dots, uh, those will be the gray dots, are in proportion to the emissions. And you have a box there in the middle with some examples here. So this data set ranges from uh, starch at 100 kilotons emissions per year. And that would be the total emissions then. And then in this plot, it goes up to uh, 3.1 million tons of, of CO2 per year. Um, and then it ranges in between there. And here you can also see small turquoise dots. And those are the ongoing and or planned capture facility projects. And here it's a bit more fussy. Some of them are already quite advanced and some of them are more conceptual, but it's what's uh, communicated at least. And I should say also that as we go along, uh, all these maps are basically what uh, we as researchers are able to learn from the internet or from the project websites. So um, that should be said as well. So comparing this then to the existing or decided storage projects, and this is perhaps also old news, but this is the nonetheless the starting point here. And uh, you can see in this plot, uh, of course, the Slakenet project, the Snurvit project, here we have the, uh, the Longship uh, Projects Phase 1. Uh, so this would be the Aurora project, uh, storage points of 1.5 million tons. Um, here you have the Project Greensand uh, Phase 2, I think, uh, where they uh, have a similar capacity range. And I've also included the storage project in, in Netherlands. That would be the Portos project. Um, but uh, noticeably, all the dots here are red. And, and by that, uh, from what I could learn, uh, those are already filled with capacity, um, meaning that no 
uh, other CO2 than what is already in the products is going to be stored there. So if we uh, go a little bit further, further uh, into the future, in 2026, these are the storage products that we can see uh, are communicated as, as planned in the, in the region. Uh, so now uh, we can see that uh, noticeably the Aurora product phase two uh, does not specify where the CO2 is, is aimed to come from. And uh, so I've added there a circle of an additional 3.5 million tons. Uh, also, you can see in, in Iceland, uh, the CODA terminal phase one is uh, aiming to uh, be able to store 500,000 tons per year, I believe. Uh, the large red circle is the uh, last phase of the green sand product in Denmark. And uh, in their website states that they could uh, capture up to 8 million tons uh, in the year um, 20, uh, 2025 to 2030. So I've included them here. And although in, in, my, in my view, it, it, it sounds like they are mostly uh, looking at Danish emissions. So that's why that's red. And so uh, it's the same with the, with the UK product here. That would be the Liverpool Bay product. And they are also very aimed at the uh, UK cluster. And now then the last map is um, 2031 plus I've named that. So this, these are increasingly speculative, of course, but here we see, I think Egil, you mentioned these products as well. Uh, that would be a new license for Equinor to store uh, up to 20 million tons of CO2 per year. And the Coda terminal project is a bit larger. And uh, there's also a project in Italy, uh, the Ravenna CCS hub, uh, where they state that they could potentially capture um, around 2 million tons per year. That comes from other countries than Italy. And then the, uh, the largest circle there, that, that's this, the Norton Endurance Partnership project in the UK. And they are also very focused on two UK clusters, which is why that is, this, is, this is red. But so that was the very short uh, kind of mapping of the situation. So I just wanted to uh, reiterate now that the problem is how to achieve this full chain CCS. And hopefully uh, you will have some interesting discussions on this. So I would like to leave you with these two questions. Uh, what can be done to improve the preconditions to realize investments and who can coordinate between capture and storage stakeholders? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's uh, certainly a lot of potential in the Nordic region, but of course you're right that uh, it all has to work together for uh, investment uh, to actually take off and to minimize the risk. Um, and uh, with this, uh, we have reached the Q&A. Uh, we have one question in the chat uh, right now, um, but I can ask all participants. You can think about uh, if you have any questions for the speakers now, and then you can write them in the chat, as I mentioned in the start, or if you want to ask for any clarifications or similar, you can also raise your hand and ask your questions in uh, here for everyone. Uh, but if we start with the first question, uh, Svante, it's for you. And uh, it's, uh, you mentioned uh, that there will be a new hardwood category. Can you explain more about that? Um, it is about the reporting to UNFCCC about uh, negative emissions. We, the authorities in Sweden have been working with this and we, uh, so we, we would probably suggest that there should be that they should be ac accounted for as a land use, land use change and forest. And in that case, it means that there should be a, some kind of new category of hard wood products in, in Lulu CF, really to show that CCS is something very different from storing carbon dioxide or carbon in, in wood, for instance, if you have a building due to the permanence of the storage when you have do CCS. Great, thank you, Svante. And uh, the next question is for uh, Egil. Uh, is it correct that no further public funding is planned in Norway? There yeah, was the unmute button. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's uh, the answer in big letters is yes, no plans exist. On the other hand, um, recently, the Norwegian Environmental Agency, uh, Miljødirektoratet, uh, presented 
a report uh, stating that uh, there are volumes that are uh, where bear um, CCS of the lowest hanging fruits to uh, to uh, to take care of those um, emissions, uh, and that is especially from uh, local waste incinerations from some and um, from some industries. Um, the government uh, has uh, has some ambitions in their political platform about addressing these emissions, but so far that has not resulted in any any aims for uh, for taking those um, emissions with CCS. But you you cannot disregard that this will come uh, within a year or, or something. But uh, no plans as it is now. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Egil. I do not see any additional questions in the chat right now. Nikki? Is there yeah, Henrik. Can I can I come with a follow up question? Yes, for you? of course, that, of course. That might be of uh, of general interest. I, I are you then looking at the uh, sort of CO uh, two tax levels or other incentives for uh, for sort of uh, driving the implementation of of CCS? So it's not like in the Danish case where you just pose a lot of money out, but uh, but uh, use taxes. Uh, I, I will say that we have not got into how we shall uh, incentivize this, but the fact is that, uh, and then I have to speculate if that is of uh, any interest, <laughs> the, the, what we observe and when we uh, answer in the press, uh, and what we observe is that when we now are establishing the long ship with the with the northern lights uh, storage uh, site then and a new storage sites which are coming we are the costs of storing co2 has been dramatically lowered i think that is one of the aspects of the norwegian uh, efforts that that is uh, really a takeaway issue this that the government has taken responsibility for for realizing the infrastructure and then it's up to the private uh, emitters to see if they can make uh, a commercial uh, activity out of it and that is exactly what has happened with uh, with Yara in the Netherlands they do not get any support from from the Netherlands authorities uh, it's only the ETS that is on the that is incentivizing that project. So hopefully there will not be a third world war uh, in the meantime, uh, and then and the gas prices will uh, co come back to where they belong, and then uh, they probably have a project that without any state subsidies. When it comes to the mainland Norway, we think that on the waste incineration issue there are really opportunities for local governments to to fill some of the gap so uh, yeah that is a, a start of a long uh, long answer <laughs> thank you thank you so much Egil. uh henrik i uh, hope that yeah of course yeah i hope it answered your question and uh, that is uh, actually what uh, we have time for for this first part uh, we will now take a five minute break before we enter into part two, where you will conduct some discussions uh, on the CCS development and uh, how you can um, deepen your collaboration in the future. Uh, so the, it's 10.24, so see you all at uh, 10.29. Uh, and uh, then we will, uh, I will provide some more information then. So uh, 10.29.